There's a, uh, a lot to talk about. I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll start with a few questions and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, so my first question is, within your body of work, there are smaller bodies of work that cluster yeah. around locations. Um, it, like in tonight's program, three films are associated with your hometown of Mansfield, Ohio. Three more take place in Salisbury, North Carolina. Yeah. And then Rita Larson's Boy is um, affiliated with your parents' hometown by virtue of the fact that the actor um, was born there. So. Well, he was actually, he visited there, but he got family there. Okay. Yeah. But I, I wanted to know, if, uh, could you talk about um, the sense of place in your work? And I'm curious how much um, location drives your work. Yeah. Well, I, I think it mostly drives me. I don't know if it drives the viewer, because you can't see location in these films, I don't think. Except for maybe round seven, where they, when you see the, the, uh, the old arena in Dayton, Ohio. But, um, but and I think it's just, just for me to get there and find subject matter, I think. And then it becomes about a place. And even the last one, Weston House, was it three? Because there's a several of those, and then that's about um, you know, objects made at the factory. So working in my own town, so that's kind of about a place to me, whatever. But it's not important to the viewer, so to speak. So I think those are just point of departure to get me to these particular communities and stuff, and just to find subject matter, I think. And, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I wanted to ask you about portraiture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Formally, it seems like it's. Kind of what the same going on in these films, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I thought maybe we could talk about looking at your the world premiere of Westinghouse Three. Yeah. That film. Yeah. Um, you in in the notes you write that it's about a consumer product. Yeah. Um, but when we see it on screen, it's very much a, a lyrical portrait of a man ironing. Yeah. Um, but then um, this apparently simple film is actually there's more to it. The I understand you made the iron. Yeah, yeah. The irons are based on um, early irons were made by the Weston House Corporation, mm -hmm. and I just casted them in rubber, um, so they don't function. So I like. So I used to make props for for, the, for a lot of the films, and but those props always functioned, like the bell and the Matthew St. Matthew, uh, St. Matthews, um, the tools and the manhole covers are made for those other films. And there's some props playing on Monday night on some of the films, but um, but these I've been trying to make and I've been trying to make objects that don't function but look like they function so to speak. So so yeah, and then so just kind of seeing them struggle ironing with a rubber iron, right? <laughs> yeah, which is only riveting to me. Um, <laughs> yeah, as an artist, whatever. But but anyway, I like those kind of like gestures. Whatever. And, and then now I and now I'm making multiple of these things, so I'm like kind of cracking these things like a factory. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, another question is about the sense of time in your films. Um, in round seven, we're, we hear an old story, and it's playing out playing out against an indifferent contemporary landscape, and this woman alone announcing the rounds, mm -hmm. and intercut with. Um, what appears to be maybe a performance of, like it, it appears to be a, a vintage film, but it may actually be a performance of boxing. So can you talk about how you bring a sense of the past into the present? Yeah, well, like round seven, hold on, there's, there's another film in here. Well, of course, Good Fight, they talk about the Good Fight, but I've been making, like, I've been making these films based on um, events or people or objects that were represented from my hometown. And I do remember this cat used to, this guy named Art McKnight, and uh, I remember I used to, uh, people I know used to shoot dice with him, I ain't saying who, but he used to shoot dice with him. And uh, I remember he was like kind of like, you know, he was a dang, he was a boxer. And I remember uh, my brother said he got me from shooting dice because I saw him beat a guy for 50 cents. And when a boxer hits you in the streets, I mean, it's just like a legal weapon, so to speak. So Art was running, we're running around like that. And I do remember he fought Sugar Ray Leonard. He was, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, I don't know, people, he 
young, but um, I'm a sports guy. And one of the best teams ever was the 1976 Montreal U.S. Olympic boxing team. And the Sphinx brothers, Sugar Ray Leonard, Aaron Pryor were all on that boxing team. And Sugar Ray had turned pro, and and this was our McKnight. Well, um, Sugar Ray Leonard was being criticized for being white and tight meaning that he didn't fight any black boxers. So they picked Art McKnight because he had just fought a grueling fight with Aaron Pryor like three or four weeks prior. So I guess they thought that Sugar Ray could beat him pretty quick. But um, So anyways, I didn't remember that fight happening. I do remember um, Art won't admit it, but I do remember the crowd got really rowdy. And my uncles and were all down there. So they were throwing chairs on the table, throwing chairs on the, um, because they called the fight. And they threw chairs and stuff on the, um, in the ring. And because the Sugar Ray got cut, that's the only, there's only three Sugar Ray fights that you cannot find. And then even I had to get a hold of the ABC affiliate in London, they don't have it. Like, like there's no tape of this fight. It didn't like, like exist on planet Earth. So then, so basically I had to tell Art McKnight to like reenact, you know, talk about and first he couldn't remember, and they said, just make it up. I don't care what you know. Because <laughs> the whole idea of it. And then time's important, too, because a lot, I don't know if any of these films, some of them are hand-cranked, and, and then the whole idea of things last the long that they should be. And so I wanted um, each roll of film to be three minutes long. But then, that did, and then, but then that was just too much dialogue, so I kind of cut it down. So I wanted um, each, because the fight was, it was an eight-round fight, it was called the seven. And then, so I just, but then Art started to remember a lot of it, so to speak, when we started talking. And I remember we couldn't find a good audio play, so we went to this chiropractor um, office to record the audio, and you could hear people <laughs> get their back cracked, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> can pick it up. But it depends on how good the sound is. So anyway, like Art started to remember all these kind of crazy things and stuff, so it became accurate. So then we found a, um, a young Golden Gloves boxer who took instruction pretty well. And it, so he just reenacted what Art, um, Art's, um, Art's role in the fight. And we shot it in the Puerto Rican gym on the west side of Cleveland. And then that was, and then I usually, because when I light a film, I usually light the high thing. <laughs> so we just kind of hit it during the gym with the lighting and so to speak. Because uh, uh, I didn't want them to take down their, uh, their proud flags and stuff like that. So we just didn't light it. And, um, but, um, but yeah, but then for me, it was all about like those kind of moments and stuff. And I like when people tell stories, and Art's a good story, he likes a story. And he, and he became a really good storyteller, because I didn't really know. Because I hadn't seen Art until I was like 16. Um, but, um, but yeah, but I like kind of putting together those things. I don't know if I answered your question. That's been more fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause I Because I just remembered most of all the stuff that was involved in it. And then, then the fight took place in Dayton, Ohio. But Art wasn't from Mansfield. He had been he, he was just in, in jail. Mm -hmm. And anyway, my hometown had a lot of prisons and, and then he and he stayed in Mansfield after he was released from jail and mm -hmm. became a professional fighter and, you know. mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, one more question then I'll open it up to the audience. And maybe this relates to this. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you about um, your use of language and speech in films. Uh, it, it seems that language is often a documentary element where image might contain performative elements. And I was interested to hear you, your thoughts on that. Well, for me, language is performative too, well, because I like how people speak in their native tongue, so to speak. And, you know, and then, you know, there's 51 million black Americans and we all can speak the same, so I like the kind of dialogues in between, you know, how, you know I'm looking for those kind of input, like, it's like the nations that are part of regional, um, you know, and there wasn't this South, with North Carolina, what else was going on? Um, there wasn't too much kind of regional. Um, I, I just filmed called Park Lane, which is eight hours long, and, and these guys were speaking during the, the longest take of it, it's like 33 minutes of lunch, and I could not understand these guys, because they were from the mountains of Virginia, so I did not like that kind as a language, so to speak, and, and I like people have their own kind of language, whatever, so to speak, and, and I'm trying to think of, um, yeah, and I don't know, I just like the kind of, you know, 
And for me, it like it does have to be audible. It has to be about form, so to speak. Right. Yeah, more so than anything else. Yeah. Kind of, like, was there a lot of talking going on? Oh yeah, um, Malik Hutchins was like um, he's from Philadelphia, but from Virginia. Yeah, yeah, he just passed away in the fall. So uh -huh. yeah, but um, yeah, he's a solid brother. And then that film was actually commissioned. I got commissioned to make um, film about the Black Migration and uh, the great. The 100th anniversary of the Great Black Migration to Philadelphia. And so, and then so I was dealing with people who were a part of the Garveyite kind of, uh, like the kind of movement, whatever. So, and so anyway, so he was like, but anyway, I like the way he talked and stuff, yeah, so speaking. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's open it up to the audience. Any questions, comments? Quiet, I'll say this. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I know everybody here. <laughs> yeah, what's going on? Hey, um, I, uh, I wanted to ask a question about the relationship of uh, Improvement Association and cars down south, specifically in relation to um, like uh, migration. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, I just felt like I felt like those two pieces were talking to each other, and uh, I just wanted to hear you talk more about. Yeah, that. a lot of my and actually a lot of my early artwork. Because I, I was trained as a photographer, a sculptor, and printmaker, and painter, and stuff. And a lot of my stuff has always been about black migration. My family comes from Mississippi. I'm the first generation northerner, like a lot of my friends call themselves that. And so I, and then, so I never knew why they moved there. They always say, oh, because of jobs, and to do better, I don't know, that kind of thing. But then I never kind of knew the kind of whole story. But <coughs> to pick up and leave and take root somewhere, I think it's very traumatic. And you know, and enlightening and, you know, and brave, I guess, so to speak. And then so, and I think, it's, and to get people to talk and stuff, I normally just have people just talk about, like, where you're from? And, you know, just tell them where you're from, where you're born and raised. And then it just kind of just keep going on and on and on about it, so to speak. So I like those kind of narratives. And, and then that's an easy way to get people to talk about their kind of narratives, so to speak. And, and then those films were kind of part of the same project. I was trying to find a, that, and they're all based on that that commission from uh, Scribe. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, like Louis Messiah, <coughs> a filmmaker from Philadelphia. He was um, he that, like he commissioned like me, Julie Dash. I can't remember the other filmmakers or, or artists involved that were trying to keep thinking about the one that year, Black Migration. And so I was following this um, this Garvey guy, um, John Walker, like. Easton, so I was trying to find kind of con connection to his hometown in, in you know, North Carolina. But then so I started asking everybody else about their story. And even, you know, in the, in the, in the Cars family, because that was three generations of Cars. And I like that because they all look the same age, you know. <laughs> like, what well, this kind of like my family, like since Reconstruction, like ever since been having kids as teenagers, so we all look, so we all look like triplets sometimes, you know. But, um, but, but but anyway, but even people who didn't move and, and people who stayed, I think it's more important too as well, because you know, because people always talk about the black, you know, the big the great black migration, but majority of black stayed, you know, um, you know. So but then we talk about people who stayed, so to speak. They always like to kind of do the kind of Darwinist kind of narrow uh, kind of um, narrative about how people got better and moved up north. A lot of people stayed. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Hey, uh, just before I ask you a question, I just want to say how I was touched by Improvement Association. I thought it was really yeah. exquisite. Mm -hmm. so, um, what informed your migration from uh, the other arts, from printmaking and painting and photography into film? What work did you see? What was the moment? It's <laughs> mostly a story, you like family. Just Mansfield, Ohio, like where I'm from. Because nobody was from there. Like, you know, like at least my friends were all, like I said, they were first generation Northerners, and then so why they look like, and then you know I don't know. You live in a small town, then you know like like it's all about your family. You know people are like, no, where y'all from? It's like uh, Tennessee. It's like, mm. you know, you know, like 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 they pass judgment on like what neighborhood in Columbus are you from? Possum town? Mm. You know, like because they're horse thieves. You know, so then like I like how you know people have those kind of simple narratives from for you know so like. 
I think what has always been about a theme for me too is you know forever. And even my guy friends from London and stuff, I always talk about well, where they're from, you know, from with the West Indians when they moved. Um, <laughs> and so so that whole idea of this this kind of the black diaspora is really important to me. But I do like why people stay. You know, I like how people just stuff. I mean, it's not like the most you know. Like, I always like, well, I got friends from New York and stuff, they're like, the South. But I, I love the South. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know, it's better than the North. You know, I don't know, the North. Like, I, like, 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 every time I go, I teach at this Bard College in the summer, uh, the MFA program. And then the more I go up there, the more I'm like, fucking Northerners. You know, I like, can't, you know. But then, you know, like, the South, west of the, you know, east of the Mississippi, uh, Mississippi is, you know, the Mason Dixon line. Malcolm X quote is a Canadian border, and it's absolutely true, and it's always been that way. But but people like to make a hierarchy, like people like northern, like like the ruling class from the north, like 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 to create a hierarchy and always say it's them, them, them down south. But it's but it's you know again, the Mason Dixon line is a Canadian border, so so to speak. Yeah. And then everybody here is from like I ten, right? We, we, where at Los Angeles? Yeah, so yeah, so everybody here is from the I-10 corridor, like Louisiana, um, Florida, Texas, you know, Texas, you know, so so that migration from you know, here. Yes, yes. Sir. How do you choose whether to come on sixteen millimeter or digital? Uh, mostly at time, time um, like the Proof Association, I wanted to use a whole roll of film. Um, yeah, there's three films. That, that's probably the most digital you're ever going to see out of me for a while. But um, I think I just had to, like, I like to, like, what, I'm going to nerd out for a bit, but I like to put seam out, like, I don't like the HD kind of look, um, I like a kind of a, I don't know, um, what do you call it, a, a provisionalist kind of way of, of, like, not painting, you know, like, kind of make it, and so, so I think I had all these seam out, uh, lenses on these black magic cameras, and, and then, but for me, it's all about kind of time, you know, how long it takes. And then I like how each whip material kind of give me these kind of limitations. Like, again, like, like each box and uh, rounds will be a roll, like a whole roll of film. So it's, yeah, yeah, you know. But for me, it's mostly the cameras, what the camera can do, uh, and, what, and what the material for the camera can do. So, so I like, so I'm in love with an Aries, and so now I'm like hanging Craig and Bolex now. So, um, like I'm into like not having crews anymore. Um, what was the film? Uh, Seventy kilos, I think. Was that it? Yeah. Kind of kilos. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, with a colleague of mine, um, uh, Claudia Harrow. We make films about the history of African Americans at the University of Virginia. Uh, this Black Fire program we got, and that was the outtakes of just sports one we're gonna do because everybody had tattoos and dreadlocks, and we're gonna make a period piece. And it just didn't fit with the seventies, and you know. But anyway, so like that was. Like, but again, like, I like to use those kind of lenses, so to speak, you know, and those particular cameras. And, and then for me, like those films that we make, like what there's usually a bigger crew. But I like to make a film like a painter. I like to have the kind of the tripod, the camera, and the lenses. And for me, it's like the easel, the canvas, and the brushes. So, so I like kind of like approach film like that. You know, coming from the visual arts background. Yeah. yeah. I think I answered your question. Did I answer your question? Yes. I'm like, I don't want to answer your question. Someone would answer your question? Someone would answer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, let's track it. Yeah. Who's that? Yeah. 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 So, one quick t tangent and then a question. But one is that, like, <laughs> so Nathaniel yeah, Taylor, we're, we're delighted that Post, because he also, not only was he wrong with his Tampa and stuff, but he started Larry Clark's film. Yeah. Through. Yeah. Showed that at Union Station, he came and introduced the show. Super sweet guy, yeah, yeah. But I'm curious how, for that film or for that project, why you chose or came to think of auditioning as the way to um, represent, portray whatever you're trying to get at. Yeah, well, that was like uh, Rita Boston's boy. And I remember being in Mississippi. You know, like in the summers, we'd go down there for three or four weeks in the summer in Columbus, Mississippi. Because it was on Young Man, and everybody had an 8x10 velocity of Nathaniel Taylor in their house, whatever. 
And, I, and, then, and for years I thought he was from there. But he had family there, he was from St. Louis. So I've been, so I've been looking for him forever, you know, and then I couldn't find him. And then he did change his name slightly, but we couldn't find him. So my buddy Nick Turner used to work for the People magazine, and he tried to get a detective to look for him, couldn't find him. And then I said, fuck it, I'll just have people audition for his role in San Francisco, you know. And then that's how that came about, whenever. Because um, there was this connection, you know, I'm just, you know, I don't know if it's all about but some, this kind of like avenue for me to kind of like have, kind of, own, you know, take a little ownership of like how I could kind of get to him. And, and as being in relationships, everybody had these eight by 10 glossies, like in, his, like in their home. Even my grandmother had eight by 10 glossies. But uh, but then but then I did make a film with him years ago and stuff like that. Which, and it was great to meet and stuff like that. It was like fantastic. Um, yeah. But then for but then for years, like I wanted him to teach my son to act. I was gonna do all this kind of crazy shit where he would. And then like I just I was wanting him to go this full throttle like put some passion into me. I didn't have these kind of ideals, all these films that have no in it, so to speak. And and then so it just and. She just when I couldn't find him, I just uh, think Madeline was up shooting a film in Cleveland, so she just got all these actors together and just put them, you know. And then a few of them had directions, like some of them I kind of told them to kind of screw up a little bit, you know, you know kind of thing. But but they mostly did, but they you know they didn't feel like that, so I made it kind of made it like this kind of audition because I've been trying to find an audition tape of people applying, of uh, trying to get in this. Uh, does anybody know this show, San Francisco? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd be surprised. Uh, like I said something in class re recently. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Nobody knew what it was. So I was like, and teacher mode could win finals week. But uh, but yeah. But anyway, I just wanted to find like a bunch of like actors of like you know. I don't know if anybody knows some archive Hollywood place that would have like reels of people applying for roles in San Francisco. I'd be glad to use them or I'd be abusing or whatever. <laughs> Anybody? Would that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I know everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm wondering for, you know, most of your films take place in the U.S. and, you know, are uniquely situated around African Americans, so to speak. Mm -hmm. The only film of yours that I know that takes place abroad is BBB. That's yeah. the one I Oh yeah, 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 totally. I actually shot some films in, some of the early films were shot in Italy, actually, um, at these call centers in Rome. Um, I think there's like three films there. And um, yeah, I like to go to, to Dakar or whatever. I just never had an opportunity. Um, um, I did a lot of photography. I think this, when I was doing a lot of early traveling, I was, I was like I was still doing street photography, so I was in London a lot. And I did shoot something in Toronto. I don't know if that's <coughs> overseas. <laughs> it is in, in Windsor. That's up in Windsor. Hey, hold on now. <laughs> in Windsor, Canada. But it, no, but I, I would like to go to the car and shoot stuff. I was, um, I was on a conversation with Maddie Diop. Um, it was a great film. And her film is in Con this week or next month or something, or this month or something like that. And then so I think I'm going to go there, hopefully, maybe. Summer, so I'm going to shoot something there. But, but you know, like it was interesting, like uh, I remember when I went to, because that was a commission from the Rondon Film Festival to go to, to Brazzaville. And I picked Brazzaville because I couldn't in the condom, because the United, well, because I, I couldn't get into Luanda. And the only reason why I wanted to go to Angola, because I went, I mean, there were some kids from grad school that were from. Angola, and they would be freaked out by every time I'd speak English because because they knew people who looked like me spoke, spoke Portuguese. I just wanted to go to Angola to find some cousins, um, found them. But then, but then, so the, the one I went to brought uh, BZV was interesting because I was just trying to film people just doing stuff, regular stuff, like water skiing and shit. And it was historic because no Congolese had water skied on the Congo River, and um, so I don't know. I just I just wanted to show leisure, and people were like, and I do remember 
I don't know, man, we get those screenings and, and uh, people were angry at me. All these NGO motherfuckers, they were just like screaming at me. And the guy pushed me, he was so mad. Because like, they just didn't, because you're supposed to film Africa and it's, you know, like, you, like there's only one way to film Africa, or two, three, or four, or five, but, but not in the way that we're like, hey, people just hanging out and water skiing and shit. But, but, that, but, but, it, but it, that was kind of creepy. Whatever, so to speak, and how people like, like, like again, how like, folks had this expectation of how you should r kind of render subject matter and stuff, and render black folk, so to speak, and, and and that's pretty frightening, whatever, so to speak. But I think there's more cool ways of you know rendering, you know. So, but I, but I definitely like to do the car. I wouldn't know what. I mean, I would follow Manny D up around and shoot, but but yeah, but I just like the kind of rich art stuff that was going on, so to speak, people making art, yeah. Anybody else? Yes, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so many, so many of your pieces deal with the black cultural experience, but it's interesting to me that, like, especially with your pieces about the northern migration and collective memory, you really steer clear of sort of explicit political issues. I feel, or I'm wondering if you feel that something gets lost in recording testimony of like collective memory or experience when a work of ours could put towards a political aim or like and that, I, I think you talked about like what like what yeah, I think so I think I know what you're talking about yeah. well so for example some of your films deal with like the northern migration and you yourself were talking about the experience of sort of packing up and leaving mm -hmm. But in no, or there was no sort of mention about some of the reasons for recruiting black communities to come to the industrialized north in order to take jobs because they were paid less than uh, fellow white workers and they weren't allowed to unionize, for example. Yeah. And that's never brought up. And so I, yeah. I don't think it's your, I don't think it's incumbent upon you to talk about that. I think it's actually interesting that you steer clear of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. In these films, there's not much talk about labor at all, I don't think. Yeah, but other films I've had, they do talk about labor, you know. So these films aren't about, mostly about labor. I guess I'm afraid you work the whole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there is, like, the film Eerie they talk about. Well, I, yeah, I am, yeah. Yeah, there's, um, there's another set of films where these people are in a steel mill, and and I don't talk about that. But there's photographs of people in a steel mill, and you can tell by what they're wearing that they're that they're doing dangerous work because all their clothes are burnt, you know, so to speak. So like, I mean, I mean, and even my my brother's father-in-law who's worked in a steel mill, um, he wouldn't talk about. So a lot of people won't talk about that kind of stuff. And I don't press them. I don't press people about like, because I know the conditions were bad for blacks, but but in this particular film, I forgot the name of it. Watch works, I think. But as the film goes on, their clothes, the, the individuals that are photographed, and the photographs I found, their clothes get more and more like burnt, so to speak. And the jobs become more and more kind uh, uh, dangerous, but um, but I mean, I don't know if I steer clear of it, but I think some of the stuff is in there. So speak, you know? But I remember I did this film called Gary, where these auto workers are talking about their jobs, and people were freaked out because they made over hundred thousand dollars a year, like working, working in the auto factory. And I thought that was a more interesting conflict with people saying that they shouldn't make that much money as opposed to what they did, you know, because that's a skilled job, so to speak. And then so hearing the conversation around around the reaction of how these, how these people in this film talked about how much they made, and pe folks are more freaked out by uh, that than in, within anything else, so to speak. So they, so like then there's this kind of situation where people think they should make less than so-called professional or educated or college-educated people and stuff, and that's a shame. You know, but that's kind of thing. But yeah, but yeah, but but, 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 but,
But yeah, I don't know if I steer, steer clear of it though, but it just, people just don't talk about. It's hard to get people to talk about the past, let alone, you know, I know, you know, I finally got wanted to talk about Vietnam this year. Um, and he just talked about how, how cool, I don't know, it, you know, they had one, you know, because I wanted him to talk about Hawaii, I was like, oh, so, yeah, I, I, like, I got to nag him on, and I was like, well, there's a lot of racism in the army, <laughs> you know, I was kind of like, yeah. he was like, no, but I did, I went down to South Carolina, but they wouldn't let me do laundry in this one laundromat, that's one thing he said. And for me, that was like, awesome, because, you know, he's just being honest. And then, and then you know, I think we have this preconception notion that how everything was just so rotten back in the day, you know, sometimes it wasn't as, you know, it's bad, so to speak. Some people just don't want to bring it up, you know, you know, like, like so to speak. But yeah, but I, I, but I didn't think the question, but did I answer it? Did I answer it? Yeah, I think the emphasis is more on the, that there's a certain substance that's lost when the instrument of life stays towards the political lines, like especially in your work. Right? I think that, I, I guess I didn't mean to steer clear in a negative sense, I meant it more of a, it's interesting that you, yeah. you choose not to do that. Yeah. It seems rather deliberate. Well, it's more like, I don't want to sit in a ruling class. Like, that's the deliberate thing. And I don't even think about it. Like, I don't, you know, I don't, like, it's not about how the ruling class, and then a lot of people are like, well, I remember me, and, like I said, me and my colleague, we make these films about the history of African Americans at the university, and my colleagues at the University of Virginia, they're always like, so, you know, you, I mean, you, what you can tell they were kind of easing in, is, so, you know, was there a lot of racism at the university? Like, there still is, the motherfucker was made by a slave owner, <laughs> you, know, you can't get away from it. But I think they want to be told that, like, that they want to bring, like, they want to somehow you know, be a part of the center of it and stuff. But, but like the way I formally structure things, that they're not part of the center of it, so to speak. You know, like black people just don't wake up like, damn, white like, folk. Well, you know, you know. <laughs> Some people do. <laughs> you know, but it just like it just doesn't come up that much in dance. I did so I so my deliberation of it. It's just basically I don't want to center it. The ruling class and stuff. So, so I like to do kind of things that like that is internal, you know. Like I don't go to church at all. I'm big they did in town, but I got a lot of gospel music and a lot of gospel stuff in the films because that's like because then that's cultural. It's like we get more cultural than anything else than how somebody else is perceiving black people and kind of creating language for us to speak. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great. I mean, I you know, that, like, it was a great dialogue. About how, to, but and then for me, that's about framing too, as well. I mean, like those about formal quality and stuff. You know how, you know. And for me, those are things I kind of think about as an artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. What? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, I'm not keeping y'all. I've been up for like twenty hours. Thank you so hours. much. <laughs>